How's it going? My name is Jameis. Hello, nation. Uh, I'm going to do a introduction to machine learning today. Uh, also, could be looked at as an introduction to data science. Here's my website. You can find the slides there. GitHub, Twitter. The goals are going to be that this is a fast, light overview uh, of supervised learning in particular, one of the categories of machine learning. It's meant to pique interest, and there is a lot of math, but I'm going to just kind of breeze through it, and I'm going to do mostly a description of what is going on rather than getting into the nitty-gritty of the math. Uh, and we will dive into some code. Uh, yeah. So I would download scikit-learn. That's what we're going to be using today. It's a Python library for machine learning. It's pretty simple. Hopefully you know Python. At the end, I'll reference other libraries you can use um, if you are a C++ fan or a Lua fan or whatever. But scikit-learn is common. And this will take a little while to download, so you might need to pause while it downloads. Or I don't know. OK, so machine learning is uh, historically broken into three categories. And some would debate this. But supervised learning, basically you have a multi-dimensional set of inputs. So you have examples, uh, what you would call big data, and that maps to an output. And the output can be a uh, quantity, or it could be a category, like what's in the picture, or maybe the price of a house. Unsupervised learning is discovering structure and data that we didn't know was there. We don't have the category it is, or the quantity that it is, and we need to uh, ingest the data and, and figure out some structure that's inherent to the data. Reinforcement learning is what you would learn in like an artificial intelligence class with game playing um, and environments that are dynamic and you're trying to achieve a high score or some goal. Okay, so supervised learning is what we're going over today and it's essentially broken into classification and regression. You see on the left, classification is basically, this is a binary classification, so you are classifying things as say a cat or a dog and you're creating a decision boundary in this graph that basically says, if it's on one side of the decision boundary, it's a cat. If the data point is on the other side of the decision boundary, it's a dog. Now, regression, which has uh, been around for a long time, statistical um, concept, is basically you're predicting a, uh, a, 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 a value that's continuous. So maybe your output is 10.25 or... 1156.3. It's not a category. So we're going to go over regression today primarily. And here's a simple regression example. Basically you have a function that takes in area and it outputs price. That's our theory. We're trying to build a function that given some area we can guess what the price is. Right? So how might we model this uh, using math. Well, he here's a bunch of historical data we have. We have the square footage of the house, and we also have the price of the house. And these are just data points, and we're going to attempt to learn some function that maps decently well to these data points. So our hypothesis is that it is linear. It's just a simple line. We believe that there is some sort of relationship, a, ver a relatively strong relationship between uh, linear growth in the square footage and the price of the house. So, just a little bit of math, and I won't, uh, you know, dwell on this for too long. But basically, at the bottom here, we have a hypothesis of a line, right? This is just y equals mx plus b. That's all that is at the at the bottom. And what we need to do is we need to figure out thetas or the parameters or the weights of this hypothesis function so that the line does a good job of fitting our data. All we're going to do is tweak those two knobs just so that the thetas line up so that we have a very small amount of error between the line and all of the data points. Once we have this hypothesis function, we can then input new data, the new area of a house, and it will predict the price. So we put in the x, and it will output a y, and say, 
this is in my guess as to what the um, price of the house would be, right? So we take a training set, and that training set is just a bunch of data. We have the prices, which is the target uh, values, and we have our features, which are just right now just the area of a house. And our goal is to take that training set, have some algorithm learn a function that maps relatively well to that training set. And then once we have that function, we are able to put in new x's with unknown y's, and it will predict a very, uh, a relatively approximate guess for the y. I hope that makes sense. So basically in this picture right here, we have the prices, but let's say instead of blue dot, we get a red, we want to predict a red dot. That's kind of confusing. Let's say we just get a new value of 3,000 square foot house, and we don't know what the price should be. Well, given that it's 3,000 square feet, we will map to approximately $400,000, right? Approximately. Because this is the best fit line that we created. And if we got a new house that was 4,500, it would map to 600,000, right? Because this is just our guess. Well, what happens is we introduce new dimensions of uh, new features. And so the rows here, each row is, uh, is going to be an input. And on the right column is our target. It's our Y. It's our output that we want to map to. And we're taking two inputs, the area and the number of bedrooms, and we're attempting to map it to a Y. Now, in the beginning, we have our training set, and we're going to fit a function to that training set. And later, we will not have the output price. We will merely be passing in new data with feet, square feet, and bedrooms, and we will be guessing the price. So this is in two dimensions. And what happens is, let's pretend that the Y and the X are area and number of bedrooms. We will take that data and all those little points that are floating there. Those are our data points. Those are our training set input data. And we are going to find a plane in three dimensions that fits that data very tightly, very well. And it also fits the Z axis, right? Now in the future, we will not have the price or the Z value. We will merely be inputting a Y and an X and seeing what point on the plane it maps to in the Z axis. So let's say we put in 1x and 0 or and 2y, right? Right here. Now we go vertical and we just see where it intersects with the plane. And that value is going to be our guess for the cost of the house. That's going to be our output of our learning function of the of our hypothesis function that we created. We're going to guess new values. So what happens basically is you have more dimensions than two, right? And your brain can't think about them because we learned to walk around this world in three dimensions. But math is able to handle it with linear algebra. And so basically you have the second row is what I was talking about with the plane. This time, though, we will be learning three parameters in our learning algorithm that we haven't talked about yet. We'll be tweaking three knobs until the error is very low with the data. And then if you go into more dimensions, you just basically have to tweak more knobs before that plane, that hypothesis function, fits your training set very nicely. And that's what we call a hyperplane. And you can condense it down. This may actually be wrong. I can't remember. This is actually how you write it, I think, if you only have one dimension. I'm not sure. OK, I might have messed that up. Maybe I'll fix that later. So what we do here is we minimize, I'll just be very brief about this, but we're minimizing our hypothesis function, the, what we're guessing between the actual output of our training set data. And all we want to do is minimize j. This is called the least squares equation. And basically, we are going to minimize this cost. This equation quantifies the total error between your guess, h of x, 
and the training set outputs y. So all it does is quantify it, right? It'll say, your hypothesis gives me an error of 100 or 111 or whatever. And we're going to use calculus to minimize this function because we want to minimize error. And that will just move the hyperplane around until it finds a nice little spot where it has minimized the error between the training set and our guess. Now this is kind of a, an interactive example. Don't need to worry about the math too much. But this math is basically, it's gradient descent. Uh, there's, this has been around for a long time, and it, it's very well known. And stochastic gradient descent is used a lot. But the, the, the gist of it is you're at some point in this error bowl, right? Think of the, this as a deep bowl. And each step you take is going downward, in a downward slope. And eventually you will get to the low point of the bowl, which means you have minimized error and you get a nice fitted line, a nice fitting function. Now this is the gist of machine learning, you basically create or of supervised learning. You have an error function that you want to minimize. Uh, and error functions can be very complex, like if you're trying to minimize the error on a guess of what is in an image, that's very difficult. Um, but in this example, I mean, yeah, this, I can't exp this is such a good slide because this is the gist of it, right? You've got your training data and your hypothesis, and your hypothesis keeps getting more accurate and more accurate, ideally, and then eventually you find a good approximation for those knobs, the thetas, the weights. And those are the parameters to your, 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 um, your function that guesses for you. And, you know, neural networks have tens of millions of parameters that they have to fill out. So these things can get really complex. Just to revisit, this is, again, standard model for supervised learning. You have a giant training set. You take a learning algorithm that will, and you tweak this learning algorithm until you have it just right, and it will learn on this data. It will create a function that you can then input data to, unseen data that was not in the training set, and it will output a guess for you. A guess can be a number or it can be a category. So here's a very simple, simple example of scikit-learn. And I wanted to keep it very simple initially because this is, you know, just rudimentary intro uh, ground level. And we just import from scikit-learn the basic linear model and we create a linear regression classifier. Now x is going to be our training set. And y is going to be our targets. Now x is a list of lists because these could actually be like multiple points. I can't type numbers for some reason, but that's the gist. Uh, you know, they could have, well, I can't type. Okay, so it could be like, a po that right now these are just single values on the x-axis, but they could be x1, x2, x3, outputting to y. Now it's simple to see that go 0 maps to 0, 1 maps to 2, 2 maps to 4. The pattern here is you're multiplying by 2, right? 1 times 2 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. So we know that the function is basically 2x. So the, the weight that we're trying to learn to best fit those three data points is 2. 2 times x will give us a very good guess along a line of what our output should be. So using these three data points, we're going to fit a line and say this function will predict very accurately given this pattern. So we fit the linear regression classifier to our data and to our targets. Uh, and then we look at the coefficients, right? The coefficients are just the weights, the parameters, those little knobs that I was telling you about. Now, the weight that I was saying earlier is two because this is a, ex a very easy example. So the weight, the theta 1, is 2. Theta 1 times x, right? So you input a new x. Let's say we input a 3 and we input a 4. Well, the guess is the prediction has to be times 2, right? Because that's what we, we deduced. And sure enough, when you do classifier.predict on this vector of new inputs, it predicts 6 and 8. I could have also done... 
I don't want to confuse you with quantity. So I could have done this. This might have been more clear. Basically, I'm putting inputting one new data point, and I'm getting one guess. But scikit-learn allows you to put in a vector of data points, and then get a vector of guesses back. Hope that makes sense. So we have a classifier that will map input data to some guess now. All right, we're going to keep going. It's going to get a little more complex. So what if it's not a linear function? What if the ground truth function is more of a polynomial? As you can see above, we have a, we've broken down just a basic polynomial equation. You've got an x1 term, an x2 term, an x1 times x2 term, an x1 squared, and an x2 squared. And this pattern just continues if you want to have higher degrees or if you want to have, if you have more dimensions like x3 and x4. And some of these parameters could be 0, right? Everyone's seen an equation that's just like x squared, and we know that that's a polynomial, but that's just a special case of this general case. This general case allows you to fill out whatever number you want for any of these parameters. We just have to figure out the weights. And these weights will help us fit some polynomial function to this data. So in this image, the blue dots are our data. And don't get confused, the blue line is the ground truth function, the actual function that the data was generated off of. So that's not our guess. But the other three lines are our guess, based off of the degree of the polynomial. So you can see some of them miss it. Uh, you know, some of them are, are closer than others. It looks like degree of 5 is pretty accurate. And that will probably give a very low error for us, and so we'll, we would go with degree of 5. Now there is a problem, because you could keep going up degrees, and it will map a function tighter and tighter and tighter to the input data. And in the bottom right, you can see that it's trying to fit the data tighter and tighter and tighter. But in reality, we know that this is probably just a degree of 3 polynomial, right? That's a pretty smooth fit. Over here in the top left corner, that's what we call underfitting. Top right corner is overfitting. And bottom right corner, I mean, sorry, bottom right corner is overfitting. Top right is probably ground truth. Now, here's the important thing that you have to understand. When you're overfitting, you're going to get a lower error on training than when you're approximating, say, the ground truth in the top right, because it's fitting the data really super tight. So what you want to do to fix this is regularize uh, your parameters. This is very, you don't need to know all the details. If you want, you can Google lasso, ridge, elastic net. These are various methods of regularization. And this is a confusing graph, but the higher your parameter is for regularization, Higher is on the left on this graph. Don't know why. But it forces your weights to go to 0. Therefore, it forces a lot of weights to go to 0. Therefore, you have a more simple polynomial. Like instead of 10 parameters, some of your coefficients go to 0, and then you just have 2. So it's a simpler model. And I'm going to go over this uh, really quick. So this is just a regularized polynomial regression, as you can see, in scikit-learn. A lot of this code is from scikit-learn tutorials. You may need to get matplotlib. Uh, that might come with scikit-learn or numpy. I can't remember. <coughs> Ridge, right here, is a regularization technique. Uh, polynomial features is a way of mapping your input data, your x1 and your x2, to your x1, x2, x1 times x2, x1 squared, x2 squared. It's just a helper function for mapping data into a higher feature space. And then pipeline is basically chaining these operations together. So this, uh, right, okay. This x is basic, this x plot is just generating a vector of equally spaced values. It's just like an axis. There's some stuff going on here that's not that important. But um, 
what they're basically doing is they're generating random data from a ground truth function. So we're generating uh, a bunch of x's right here, and we get a bunch of y's given those x's. This is going to be our training data. This just simply creates a matrix of that randomly generated data. Oh, yeah. Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> and then we plot uh, the ground truth compared to the training points. This is interesting because this is actually this. It, this is literally exactly what gets plotted with this um, with this code. So you can see it's plotting the ground truth and then degrees of 3, 4, and 5. So we, we go through each degree, and then we have a pipeline. We generate the polynomial features based off of that degree, and then we uh, will pass it into Ridge. Now this pipeline is our model, and then we do fit given the data. So basically, it's going to run through the pipeline. It's going to expand the data points into a higher polynomial feature space. Then it's going to run that through ridge regression. And then you're going to have, your model is basically fit at this point, and you can start making predictions. Um, and this x plot is just a bunch of x points, so it's just plotting it. And we're basically just plotting it for each degree to compare. And then finish up some plotting logic. So uh, you can find this code online. I will link to it in my slides. Uh, I haven't set up a link yet. Okay, so here is a important concept that you can also uh, easily access in uh, Scikit-Learn, and I can show you how in a little bit. But you've basically got to, you have to assess your model, right? And what we talked about earlier with overfitting is that if you're mapping it super tight, then you're going to have, uh, you're going to have very low error with a training set, but it's not going to be a good uh, model. And so the key here is to hold out a bunch of the training points. And then you fit a curve on the remaining data points, and then you compare the error to that holdout set. So you held out a bunch of training data, and you train on the other 90% or whatever method of cross-validation you're using, and then you assess the error on the data that you held aside. This is called cross-validation. There are multiple uh, different approaches. I think this is k-fold cross-validation down here. And then you do that for each fold. You'll take, you know, you divide it into fractions. You hold out one fold, train on this, assess on that fold. Then you go to the next fold, you hold that out, train on the remaining folds, and you average the error. And this is a valid, this is a pretty, it's an extremely common way of assessing model accuracy. Here's a good graph. You can see the black is if you just keep everything in, all the data in, right? Um, so if you keep all the data in, the higher the complexity of the model, the tighter it's going to fit those data points. But let's say you were holding out a set and assessing against that. You were just doing cross-validation, or you were assessing against that, those holdout sets. You can see that it realizes that model complexity isn't the solution, and that overfitting is occurring, and you're basically getting worse error. Um, yeah. Hopefully that was explained well, but this is just to show you that you, know, you need to assess on data that you didn't train on. So you keep data out of the model that you're going to do your accuracy assessment on, and you keep data in that you train on uh, just so that you don't have overfitting. Oh, this, yeah, this just uh, is an example of why overfitting is a problem. Yeah. Okay, so I will do a little bit in IPython. Um, hopefully nothing goes too bad. This is not, like, going to be in detail. Uh, I'm not going to do anything very fancy. I kind of wanted to give you a quick tour of scikit-learn a little bit. Um, this is going to be very short, though. I wanted to emphasize mostly that you need IPython, because this IPython allows you to um, interact with libraries much more seamlessly, and I'll kind of show you how. So, uh, 
Okay, that was just an example, tab completion. Everyone probably knows about that, but we've got tab completion, right? So if we wanted to, we could inspect this, just put a dot, tab, and all of a sudden, look, holy, holy cow. <laughs> we have all of these linear models that we can explore. There's ridge right here. There's ridge with cross-validation. There's lasso, which is another regularization technique. Um, there is a linear model. There's a ridge classifier. Um, and then if you need to find out more, right? So linear model, lasso. Just do question mark. Um, this is not an IPython tutorial, so I won't get too much into detail, but look at how much information there is here. You've got the entire doc string available to you. It explains all of the parameters uh, and what they do and all the defaults. Another important part about sklearn is it gives you a lot of uh, utilities for downloading example data. So you've got uh, sklearn, and then you can see all the things you can import. You can see data set. Cross-validation, that library is a utility for helping split your data set into cross-validated or into folds and uh, very useful. You've got neural network, a neural network library, uh, LDA, which is a classification algorithm, uh, grid search, which is similar to gradient descent, um, pipeline, which we already saw, pre-processing, which we already saw of data. There's an SVM library, which is a categorization library. There are trees. So this is, you know, I'm just showing you that scikit-learn has a lot going on, and it's a great place to start. It doesn't necessarily scale well. It actually might now, but um, we can talk about that a little bit later. Covariance libraries, blah, 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 blah. But I want to show you this, data sets. Um, so let's just say, like, our last example. And I'm not going to finish this whole thing, but I just wanted to get you started on uh, maybe something that you can do. So you'll see in data sets, you have all of these available data sets. Um, and if you go to fetch, which is a good autocomplete, it'll just fetch a bunch of data sets from online. Uh, in this case, I'm going to do California. A lot of the tutorials online, or sorry, California housing prices, but a lot of the tutorials online will use the IRIS data set. So we're going to fetch it. Oh, and again, IPython, you can check to see what it does. Love IPython. Um, let's see if I got it. Yeah, so there's housing prices, and it's a NumPy array. If you're not familiar with NumPy, you can take a quick tutorial, but it's basically optimized for numerical calculations. Um, and you can go housing prices and be like, oh, look at all these wonderful things. So let's see what the features, what features they gave us. Okay, median income, house age, average number of rooms. So these are, each of these are dimension that we'd be fitting on to get to our target, right? Now we can go housing prices targets, I think, right? Now this is a vector of equal dimensionality or equal length as the features. And this is our target. So essentially when we did a like linear regression model, right, uh, equals, and we did fit, so basically, you've got this housing data, housing prices, right? Uh, and it's 20,000 housing, uh, 20,000 data points. And each data point is going to be eight dimensions. We already saw those eight dimensions, average you know, population, blah, blah, blah. Um, we can actually show you really quick what this data set looks like. Right, so that's, a, that's our first data point of 20,000. And uh, these map to, just to reiterate, these each map to those values. Um, and right here, so when we did the fit, I don't know if I explained this properly, but I took the linear regression classifier, and then I fit it to the data, which is our x's, which is our training set. And I also fit it to our targets. So it knows the targets now. In the future, we will just have an x, just one training, just one set of features with no price, but it will guess the price. Fit it, it explains that we have a linear regression um, class now, or whatever. And then we can basically do predict. Now, before I do predict, I'm just going to 
because the data set wasn't normalized, I have to basically know my values beforehand. So I'm going to steal one of these data points. Let's just take two. Uh, okay, let's check that. New data. Now we can do class predict. Um, New data. Let's see what that predicts. OK, so we have a prediction. Probably in thousands or hundreds of thousands. Um, and we can see how our linear model did, just at least on this one example, by looking at housing prices, uh, target, and do the same index, right? It was the second or the third data point. Cool, so it's pretty close. 3.52, 3.67. Now, this is not a very complex model. This is just simple linear regression. We could do like a, a ridge, right? I don't even know if that, I've never even used this. So it's got a default alpha, which means the alpha is the regularization parameter. And we could just, uh, there's some techniques for iterating through alphas and checking which one works best. But just as a quick example, let's, let's just uh, create a new classifier and we'll fit it. Uh, so, and then we'll do uh, fit housing prices. Sweet, we fit it. Now we do predict. Um, and you know, you don't normally predict on data that you trained on, but this is just kind of for demonstration purposes. OK, 3.67, pretty much the exact same. It is a little bit different. 3.6765 up here for the linear regression, uh, and 3.6767 for the ridge. Now, why is this? This might be because linear regression has built-in regularization. But this is just a good example of how you can fiddle with data sets. Definitely do it in IPython. It helps so much. I can't even express how much it helps. Um, OK, so that's enough for just kind of exploring scikit-learn. And you know, just get in here and do whatever you want. You want to learn how to do uh, da, 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 da. if you want to learn how to do like <laughs> neural nets, just do neural network, question mark. I mean, dang it, you have to take that out, <laughs> right? I don't know. Anyway, there, uh, IPython helps explore a lot. Uh, so just get IPython, do what you got to do, brew it, or, uh, or um, yeah, pip and saw or whatever. So I linked to a full example, m a lot more complex, uh, someone going over that data set that I referenced, the uh, California housing price example. Um, just to show you really quick, this is very in-depth. It's a more complex model. Gradient-boosted regression trees. We didn't go over trees, but trees are pretty sick. And let's see here. Beautiful graphs. All the stuff I left out. Lots of code. Uh, it kind of talks about trees, how they approximate. It's, it's, this is a great tutorial. It talks about regularization. Um, you know, I've given you an overview, and now you can dive in and hopefully understand some of the terminology. OK. So classification is something we didn't talk about, and I just wanted to address it really quick. This is the other side of the coin for uh, supervised learning. Basically, you're looking, this is a, an example of a binary classification, but we can do multi-class classification. And you're, you have a ton of data, and they all have labels. In this case, cats and dogs, but you might also have mice. Or you might have a benign tumor versus a, a malignant tumor, right? And I've listed a few of the algorithms that are popular, especially uh, where you should start. Uh, log logistic regression is basically taking linear regression and morphing it, the output, to be a classifying decision boundary rather than outputting values. So that's where I would start if I were you. Uh, you can learn about sigmoid functions. Support vector machines are an example of a maximum margin classifier. They are amazing. 
learn support vector machines. Perceptrons are very old uh, precursor to neural networks that is very powerful for online learning. Uh, linear discriminant analysis, you know, some of these are linked. You can go and mess around with the tutorials. I did want to show an example of SVMs in action, though, if I have enough time. Now, this code I did not link to. I can link to it. Um, but, because this is just, oh, this is on Scikit-Learn's website, and it's super sick. It was done by someone. I'm not giving you credit. I'm so sorry. I'll give you credit. Um, but let's say you just have binary classifier, right? And you've got a bunch of data points. And you've got these. Cool, cool. Oh, cool stuff. Okay. So then, basically, you're going to fit a hyperplane. C is the regularization parameter. Uh, and your kernel is linear. And you can learn all of this stuff later. Uh, down here, you kind of see the kernel, blah, 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 complex math stuff. Super important, but, you know, a little bit high, too, too uh, difficult right now. And you can see there's this decision boundary, and it's maximizing the margin between the decision. It could have gone like this, right? It could have divided the data like this, but it didn't, because this width between this line and the uh, basically where it touches the support vectors, it is maximizing that width. And then you have to imagine doing that in hyper dimensions, right? Multiple dimensions. Now what's cool is you have this thing called a kernel. So you can change the, basis, the basic way in which it's attempting to uh, divide data. So let's say I add some stuff over here, right? Say we have a very nonlinear uh, data set where clearly, um, you know, this is like encapsulated inside. So you, you can't really divide it with a plane or a line. We could, as you can see, the classification is doing very poorly. And we could do polynomial also. That is very poorly. But if you do a radial basis function, all of a sudden you see it's encapsulating the data so that when you input new data, Keep in mind these dotted lines are the margin. The solid line is the decision boundary. So that's where you want to you know, think about how it's classifying. Um, now when I input new data, it'll correctly classify inside the circle and outside the circle. So this is just another example of how impressive and well thought out and deep uh, machine learning goes. Support vector machines are extremely popular. They're amazing. Um, Definitely look into them for classification, but I would look into them after logistics discussion and you kind of understand what's going on with basic classification. That's an example of gradient descent. Maybe that's, well, we already looked at that. Okay. So, this is kind of the end of the, um, of the video. But I wanted to leave some links and some references and kind of just talk about, you know, where you should go to learn other things about machine learning. You can always do scikit-learn tutorials. Um, you know, pick one of these and just go through and kind of understand it. I would start with supervised learning. I would just start from the top and go down. Um, you don't need to get too deep. Mess around with the code. Move on. Learn a bunch of stuff. Scikit's pretty, pretty uh, straightforward, and it's Python, which is easy. I started with machine learning during the Stanford course a few years ago. Andrew Ng is incredible. He explains things very well, very clearly. It's a great course. Highly recommend taking it. Uh, when you want to learn at scale, when you've got terabytes of data and massive data sets and you need to do distributed computation, things get a little more difficult. Um, MapReduce it kind of created Hadoop. That whole paradigm is very important to machine learning. And it, that, that programming paradigm is kind of encapsulated with Spark as well. Spark is in memory, whereas Hadoop writes to disk. Spark is amazing. I highly recommend learning Spark, but I would learn, I mean, Spark is good for non-machine learning tasks as well, um, but they have MLlib, which is, which is their machine learning library for Spark. Uh, I really recommend learning it after you get some basics of machine learning and then you want to learn it at scale. Neural networks are incredible, very popular right now. They are convolutional neural networks are, you know, the state of the art in, in computer vision. Carpathy is 
a PhD student or postdoc at Stanford. He has excellent, in-depth, simple tutorials, blog posts on his blog. This is a great guide for hackers who are not necessarily the most math savvy to get kind of a fundamental understanding of what's going on with neural networks. Um, if you're looking for a library, Theano is cool. It's Python. It's tricky syntax because it's symbolic syntax. So you basically are defining a function in a string, your error function, or your maybe it's the activation function. Um, and then in, underneath, it's compiling that string and doing a bunch of fancy stuff. It's weird. It's not normal it's Python syntax, but it's very great framework. Um, Torch, which is originally from NYU, uh, is what they did DeepMind with. Did the uh, Atari playing convolutional neural network reinforcement Q learning uh, algorithm with? It's in Lua, and Lua is sweet. It's just a it compiles the C. The compiler is like twenty thousand lines of C, really terse language. Uh, and then there's Cafe, the Google Deep Dream. If you saw Deep Dream, was done with Cafe. So if you want to fiddle with Deep Dream, it might be worth learning Cafe. Not sure. It's out of the Berkeley Vision Lab, uh, Computer Vision Lab. And I think they have Python interfaces, but it's written in C++ primarily. So these are some great references, places to go. There's also a Coursera course in Spark, if you want to learn uh, Spark. Um, the world of machine learning goes very deep. It's absolutely fascinating. It's a perfect combination of computer programming and math. So if it piques your interest, uh, I recommend jumping in the deep end and just going wild and making your life because it's extraordinarily fun and it feels like magic. Thank you for letting me give this talk.